There is no doubt that the field of new music has never been as diverse and pluralistic as it is today. This solution, the project of modernity in general, has decomposed the concept of music as tonal, as a kind of universal language by atonality. An atonal piece of music is always open, indeterminate, in need of explanation. Every sound and even silence can belong to music, can only be the music. Postmodernism has tried to break down quality criteria, keyword anything goes, or every human being is an artist. Technologies, and most recently the digital revolution, have or are about to leave the concept of music as a sonic definition. That will be the topic of my lecture in three days. Is this still music or media art? The terms are unclear as never before. The practice is more diverse than ever. Western individualism, the sharp increase in the world's population, globalization and the loss of traditional social structures have finally also specialized, personalized, individualized and hence multiplied composing. Shouldn't an art critique correspond to this crass pluralization, individualization, specialization? In each individual case, it would first of all have to be a decryption, description, understanding, mediation, classification, creation of criteria. But instead there is the unfortunate tradition of critique, according to etymology, as Michael already said, from Krieg, actually a neutral distinguishing and separating. Instead the tradition of critique that it must criticize, that is fundamentally be critical, skeptical, know it all, set from bottom again on top, no matter how. One can't be simply and always be positive. One should write something thoughtful and what is or seems to be thoughtful, opposition, the critic thinks. According to the bad flaws, notoriously, but this and that could still, etc. There's no soup in the world without a hair found in it, or that could not have been spiced differently. Objections done, critics happy, now it looks intelligent, now it has added value. Affirmation, on the other hand, would be synonymous with naivety. Consent would appear simple-minded or implausible. Anyone who finds a hair in the soup empowers him or herself over the kitchen. On the other hand, whoever praises the soup reveals that he is worse than the cook. A thought that must arise from very low self-esteem. Generally, all that bad speaking, the embarrassing historical mistakes, even the late Beethoven, even with Liszt and Wagner, with Bruckner, whom Hanslick did not like at all and who was beset to unnecessary revisions, with Mussorgsky, whom they defamed as a dilettante, with Mahler, whom they took only seriously as a conductor, Schoenberg, who would not have got beyond Opus 10 if he obeyed his contemporary critics, Lachenmann, for whom it is the same small petty bourgeois guys that had publicly laughed at him for decades and who now earn their doctorates about him since his breakthrough. What the music critics have as guilt is longer than eras. They are historically resistant to learning, an unspeakable nuisance intellectually shameful. The whole profession is in discredit. Not that I want to compare myself with these persons just mentioned before, but to give also some contemporary examples. In two sentences about me, the Zeit managed to place three factual errors. Since then, I no longer trust any information in the Zeit. A critique from Darmstadt 2016 insinuated that I had hired Clackers, which was definitely wrong. Has ever a critique done research? He also definitely translated the name of the piece, definitely wrong, but considered himself authorized to spit on the work from his very high level. Hakan Ulus has written the report on the Darmstadt Summer Course 2016 for the Musik Texte. In it he writes, Kreidler's Fantasies of Downfall was musically too, insigni too, insignificant, too insignificant to be taken seriously. This is literally the only thing the author writes about my piece. Uh, not that one immediately reproaches, one would tear it out of context. It was, mind you, a premiere, so the piece can hardly be assumed to be already known. But especially in the case of a world premiere, the interested journal audience should first of all be told what was offered. The author, however, does not make the slightest effort to inform the readers what had happened in the piece. Instead, he vomits out his opinion on it right away, and only. That's not music journalism, that's a cesspool. Something like that should not have appeared in a journal that considers itself as serious. 
Of course, I noticed the sentence because it concerns me, but it's only one example of opinion without any argument, a silly assertion, not to say a verbal abuse. Please, arguments instead of opinions. Martin Iden wrote a whole journal article against me based on an unauthorized score. As a result, statements were put into my mouth that I never gave myself. Misinformation was scattered as long as they served only the thesis. Incidentally, it became apparent that he could not have heard the composition in the concert version to which he referred. A critique of the Neue Musikzeitung also considered himself qualified to speak disrespectfully about a music in host redactions he was definitely not seen. A Neue Zeitschrift für Musik journalist told me that he did not completely read the controversial book he was reviewing. An editor of the Musik Texte wrote a bad review on a work of mine because it would have failed the provocation claim. But nowhere was it said that the work should provoke. Not in the work, not in the program text. None of the contributors has announced such things. He has put an erroneous, absurd measure on the piece. More likely, however, it was a prejudice. The style was a strategy to generate an artificial height of fall from, he, from which he could push the piece. As a white Western man, I would act from a privileged position, a white English university professor told me. And Max Niffler compared me in a music newspaper with fascists, totally out of control. Writers who obviously make no effort at all to understand something do not give the item the most elementary interest, who only want to show themselves, who go ad personam in concert reports, they have also, again the Darmstadt critique two years ago, damned my clothes, even my pale skin color considered the Süddeutsche Zeitung Feuilleton to be worth spreading as well as the Spanish musicologist who had been collecting every single piece of material he could find, which in his opinion would speak against me. Also pieces in which I was only a performer. And who sought to compete with me intellectually in public. I did not know him until then. I did not do any harm to him, nor to any other of his guilt. And there was this critique from Neue Musikzeitung, who kindly asked me for a conversation in the concert break, which of course I did not refuse him, he praised the new creation to me to publish afterwards a total sabotage about it. This has to be, this is all this behavior for which the term reckless was invented. Because of such experience, one could despair of humanity. <laughs> Composers shouldn't have a psyche. I don't read festival and concert reports anymore. On the one hand, because you can't believe the factual information. On the other hand, because this know-it-all mentality is inedible. What should be learned from opinion laboratories overnight? In the best case, they make them the, themselves the laughing stock of future historians. Nevertheless, the genre continues to run like that, and seldom does a composer dare to complain publicly about it. Many only help themselves with the motto, do not even ignore. Someone has put this unwritten law into the world, one should not answer to critiques. It could not have been a Democrat. But, again this critique, but, the reply comes, we critics are not only here for praise, otherwise your composers can write your own reviews right away. And the composers return, you critics, if you are the know-it-alls, then you are the best and write the music yourself. We are curious. I would like to suggest a solution. It is called freedom of expression, not duty of opinion. Critics do not at all tell an opinion on the supposed value of the work in their discussions. This is completely unnecessary, just as art is not about simply pleasing. Instead, they make us understand what has been offered, mediate, unravel, analyze, develop criteria. With works of art, it is like the mother who gives birth to a child in pain. There doesn't have to be a mother and child crate in the newspaper the very next day. Nor is it appropriate to compare newborns against each other right away. And history has revealed plenty of misjudgments in every direction, underestimations as well as overestimations. So let us finally stop. Moreover, critics often seem to forget that new music is still so small compared to the whole. Much better, much more desirable would be to talk about what has been given rise, what the small plant could be, and to dress it with further information, with context, with expertise. That would be an added value, and that is still possible with even the maybe most miserable piece, of which one would still have a profit. Seeing oneself as a partner, as an assistant, it is about opening one's own ears and those of the reader, bringing a new work to outsiders with words, 
and at the same time offering an original interpretation to those who have already heard the piece. Let yourself be inspired instead of judging. Interpreting and underlining, verbally describing music and then interpreting it, just as one interprets a poem. A pianist who plays a world premiere does not criticize the work. He does not praise it either. He performs it first. This is also how the first work of journalism could be. Have part in the creation. That would be something. However, this is ambitious. It requires empathy, concentration, imagination, intelligence. But working on a piece of art for a long time is also not so easy. And the excuse that there is too little time or space doesn't count, that can't legitimize any slackness. Either you get along with these basic conditions or not, just as a composer doesn't make excuses that the deadline was too short. So should the works of art be invulnerable? No, of course not. But before attacking, space may first be given to comprehension, still the prerequisite of discourse. If, after two or three years, the work is still in consciousness and on the podium, then reflected counterpositions can also be spoken out. Let us, let us not call this a period of grace, but a period for reflection. In any case, the canon is created when someone later publishes an analysis, takes up a work again in an essay, that a piece ex is examined in detail in a radio program, that is, through positivity. And it's the curator's job to find anything worth listening to. Here too, positivity and courage. Music criticism, on the other hand, is snatchative and stays in the comfort zone. Fortunately, music criticism has little or no part in the canon, even if journalism sometimes believes it is still doing the work of a, fav a, work of a favor if it savages the piece. But journalism could have a bigger share if it was more inspiring. Now, however, one is concerned about journalistic independence. This can be, be clearly stated. If journalistic independence is good for letting go of incompetence, sadism, meanness to the point of destructive lust and parasitism, to spread hatred, to suspend honesty and politeness, then this is one of those evils that is inherent in democracy and which, with cultural effort, must be combated. After all, 12-year-olds are not yet allowed to vote, but sent to school. If someone with a quick botch on a few lines wants to raise himself over a work in which for years may have been invested, then it is the abuse of freedom. Unfortunately, this very freedom leads to infamy, to the shameless lack of culture of public insult in music criticism. Do we really want to make enemies? It hurts, of course. Artists are sensitive people, otherwise they could not create art. If a misanthropist takes a job as a midwife, something went wrong. There is a basic goodwill to be present. If you happen to listen to music and write about it that you don't like, you should criticize yourself for it. Have critics ever actually pra practiced the most important of all critique, self-criticism? Artists as well as individual pieces are not to be appreciated for their worst, but for their best they have done. Of course, I too have a lot of opinions, and by no means I like all music. But the more public the statement, the greater the responsibility. Printed material has a different status than something spoken in the pub. I would also distinguish between works of art on the one hand and theories and institutions on the other. With the second, one can argue, sometimes hard, I have often been right in the middle of it. Such engagement is also democratic commitment. But this is done at eye level, while with the asymmetrical relationship of criticism to the piece, especially with one who has only just been born, understanding, interpreting comes first, not the instantaneous thumbs up or down. I would like to remind you of what I would consider to be the basic consensus of new music. It's about novelty, unknown. This alone would therefore be a measure of compositional craft today, the strict rejection of any tried and tested method or effect. In other words, of any experience, although at the same time, all experience is required in order to be able to go beyond everything given at any given moment and to throw off experience itself. The artist's profession is so dialectical and hardly any music criticism has so far sufficed. 
it is no coincidence that Heinz Klaus Metzger, after the char characterization of the new in the face of the contradictions of craft and experience, immediately points a reference to criticism to do justice to this horizon. That's how sophisticated you can think about new music. Instead of that, in the Neue, Zü in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, the house critic noted, Johannes Kreitler has once again proved that he neither can and nor does want to compose. However, if this critique knows how to compose, then I definitely do not want to know this. Now, one could say that there are better and worse reviews, just as there are better and worse pieces. But the comparison is presumptuous. The risks and the effort are out of proportion, especially since the artists are responsible for the art, while they also suffer from the level of criticism. Small fees for others can also not be an excuse to, pro to produce at the expense of the artist. Rather, something fundamental is wrong. First of all, new music is not music. All previous criteria for how composing works, how many notes the musicians normally play, etc., are open by definition. Those who do not get along with this will be more suitable as preachers for fundamentalist regimes. Critiques as guardians of conventions, what this is supposed to be good for in art, I don't know. It, would make sense, it wouldn't make sense either and would be almost malicious to judge a serial piece, for example, by how well you can dance foxtrot to it, or to judge Mondrian by his skills in nude drawing. A work is still to be judged by what it is and not by what it is not. All preconceived models of music can potentially be revalued in new music. This is its constitutive quality, and the epistemological doubt about one's own categories may therefore always and fundamentally precede each comment, and any prejudice about composers should be erased anyway. No art form is as much in danger to fail as those who seek and try something new. A found food for vultures who still exploit the ill-fated. And the young artists are a particularly easy victim. But even quality is not necessarily recognized right away. What is immediately understandable has maybe only confirmed the already existing opinions. The critic's basic qualification for new music can actually only be a philosophical enthusiasm, a desire to discover, a Nietzscheanic affirmation, for there is never novelty without curiosity, without a moment of credit. Someone, writes Simone Weil, who has something new to say at first can only be heard by those who love him or her. Sadly beautiful, but true. The advocates are essential. Creation, these are the advocates. Without them, there is no work. Of course, as an artist, you could be happy about any resonance. In case of doubt, you can adorn yourself with the attribute controversial. But the level of journalistic music criticism is just too poor for me. Meanwhile, I avoid this rubbish completely and no longer give interviews to its authors. Democracy grants freedom of expression, and fortunately also freedom of avoidance. Nevertheless, at this point, it's not so helpful just to yell back. I want to understand. Why has there been a strong desire to argue in your music scene, especially over the last 10 years? Meanwhile, even debate culture uh, does seem to be in discussion itself in your music. The Swiss journal Dissonance has dedicated a special issue to music criticism. The Austrian music magazine two years ago dealt with the phenomenon of polemics. The Mercure also spoke out last year on criticism in the visual arts. And the Theatertreffen, the most important theater festival in Germany, organized a panel on critique in the performing arts in 2017. The Musik Texas some months ago opened the edition also with an editorial on the subject. And last year, the entire Frühjahrstagung convention in Darmstadt was on the topic clash. Even if the arguments for and against art criticism might be at least 200 years old, there are many things to be addressed again. As much as a tolerant coexistence is the politically correct attitude these days, the reality of the power of discourse and money is ignored. Theoretically, any aesthetic discussion could quick it could end quickly with a statement, okay, you just do yours and I'll do mine. Everybody's right in, post, in postmodernism. But everyone is right, but not everyone has money. There is not enough money to give every artist his or her right to perform and to attract attention. The festival's claim to objectively depict contemporary creation is a pious wish. 
Money is the last hard criterion worth arguing about. Every aesthetic debate is in fact a money, power, attention debate. All moral arguments, however, all disputes about noble values, whether this is now a, how, now a good, enlightened, how well helpful aesthetics, are mock disputes, because such values are practically never verifiable. I myself was in the midst of the debate on digitalization with Klaus Stefan Mankov in 2010. And apparent tolerance, that is liberalism, helps only the fittest to the right. That's why they argue. And the discourse is powerful. It filters and amplifies out of the majority of what is composed. There's just so much you want to filter quickly. Besides, it's not that extreme with individualism. There's also new togetherness. The number of aesthetic trends has increased significantly. Desightigkeit, new conceptualism, content aesthetic turn, new discipline, social composing, extended definition of music, Approaches that have emerged in recent years and are more than personal styles, movements that are constituted by a whole series of composers. It is probably in the logic of the whole dispositive that accumulation takes place. After the big survey on new conceptualism in the music text, soon later the next survey wanted to be done on new discipline. Composing means to initiate a music text survey. And then there are institutions, the technical standards, the traditions that still prevail, which unify. For example, when the RDT String Quartet plays a concert with premiers they have commissioned, the comparison is of course given. Composers have to write scores according to given standards for the short rehearsal period. And the concert itself has a fixed component, the applause, where every piece is evaluated and compared. Probably the pieces are also, are also all about the same length, between 10 and 20 minutes. So there's also a quick comparison, which piece now was too boring, which was entertaining, etc. There's not so much left of this individualization, pluralization, dissolution described initially in my lecture. Aditi's dream quartet, a stream into which all composers throw their scores. It is logical that in the meantime, even the Quaditiade was organized in Donau Esching and the institutionalized competition of the battlefield. Here, it would also be the responsibility of the artists. Don't make yourself so easily comparable. Institutions are unfortunately sometimes not very helpful, therefore. In many cases, they are the opposition to that. They're the ones of defragmentation, which is also the individualization. As already mentioned, symptomatic and initial for the trend towards the collectivization and simplification is applause. In our culture, every piece wants to get applause. That is to please the masses directly. And in the course of a concert, the pieces are already compared and rated on the basis of the applause, even if they are radically different. And so this might continue in music criticism instead of a variety, yeah, a virtuosity of criteria. Quickly, a conclusion is drawn. Why do artists expose themselves to applause? Why do individual listeners take part in such a mass movement? There's the blatant opposite of the individual, that is the mass behavior of the audience, the applause. No matter what kind of, what kind of piece comes, you applaud. One reacts to a work with a mass behavior in which a single individual opinion is inevitably lost if one does not behave extremely differently, that is, calls out something loud. I don't think any one of you would want to march or even chant in step somewhere else. When the Schönberg Circle founded the Verein für Musikalische Privataufführungen, the Society for Private Musical Renditions, in 1918, the statutes decreed that the audience was prohibited from displeasure comments during and after the performances. But not only that, also any applause was banned from the auditorium. This action may have been a bitter reaction to the scandalous concerts of early atonality, but it is valid beyond that. Applause is a bad habit for two reasons. First, away with this immediate collective judgment. Anything above the decency level is an instant judgment. A piece that has been worked on for months, maybe years, cannot be valued seconds after the last time. 
this notorious last word is inappropriate and presumptuous. But as it happens, the prospect of, or the fear of, applause corrupts the artists, seduces them into complacence, leads to safe effects, makes them dependent, feeds an art production that rather confirms the agreed opinion. However, after Mozart's Requiem, after Webern's aphorisms, as well as after showing Pasolini's Salo or a production of Heinemüller's Hamlet Maschine, in view of Marcel Duchamp's Fountain, other reactions should take place than applause in, uh, in conformity with the masses. Fan comes from fanatic. The individual may draw his or her own conclusions. And was Hegel slapped on his back when the Phenomenology of Spirit was published? Who once, after reading Franz Kafka's trial horror, enthusiastically applaud? A work, of, a work of art does not need any quick acclamation or instantaneous thumbs down conclusion. And the artist should, should simply be paid properly, then the audience does not need to donate applause. Besides payment, attention would be the appropriate form of appreciation. Not to clap is the louder applause. Applause is violating, silence a compliment. Second, no framing. Instead of the work of art will continue in the heads, in further actions. Instead of its vibrations being carried on, applause is pushed forward. Real and symbolic distance is created by an undemanding shaking movement with which one shakes off the piece, attaches the last form, buries it behind the noise barrier. What is the use of building tension in a piece when it's unloaded immediately afterwards? How unbearable it must seem to some people if the silence after the last bar of the score would pass into the continuity of the concert program or into the departure of people, if art and life would be harmonized, if the subtlety and energy, the openness and responsibility of the works of art were not immediately melted down into white noise, not acoustically neutralized and ugly simply covered up with these self-touch noises, but instead it would pass to the audience so they could handle it well. And even, for, even more so, if the audience was irritated by art, as the phrase likes to claim. If the audience is really irritated or even disturbed, then it can't still clap, then it shouldn't have to. Well, and if the audience is enthusiastic about what they have experienced, then they should make love to each other. <laughs> Berlin, Komische Oper, Bernd Alois Zimmermann's The Soldiers. At the end of the piece, Holocaust, atomic bomb, apocalypse. And 10 seconds later, Bravo! Lachen, man, the little match girl, Teatro Colón, Buenos Aires, standing ovations. Hey, mood! Hey, mood! Cheering! I wonder if that will help the little girl who froze to death. It's grotesque. So many art wants to be profound, existential, even abysmal, enlightened, or thoughtful, or critical. But the artists, in contrast, behave in a primitive obeyance ritual. Everyone involved should be committed to art, to the work. The audience, by any rate, is responsible for eyes and ears, not the manual dignities. You can join me. The hands of one of the gentlemen were laid on Kay's throat, while the other pushed the knife deep into his heart and twisted it there, twice. As his eyesight failed, Kay saw the two gentlemen cheek by cheek, close in front of his face watching the result like a dog he said it was as if the shame of it should outlive him you didn't for that man jack 
devi rinforzarti per la notte d'amore che ci attende. Non c'è nulla di peggio che un alito privo di alcun odore. Eva. No one listening to music at home thinks it's appropriate to applaud the loudspeaker afterwards. Also in the cinema it usually works without. And the procedure is actually very boring. A waste of time. At the Burgtheater in Vienna, the so-called ban on curtains from 1778 was applied until 1983. Acts of bowing are to be omitted because this would disturb the impression of the action to be depicted. At concerts in churches, especially with pieces like the St. Matthew's Passion, it's usually noted in the program booklet that due to the subject matter, please refrain from clapping. Also with art religion, this should apply in principle. All art has so much dignity. Abolish applause. Imagine if a blouse had been abolished in the entire Darmstadt courses. You think that's scary? One would really have to form one's own opinion after each piece. Each piece is somehow not as complete, rounded off as after a blouse and bowing, but perhaps floats even further in the minds. One lets each individual think on, and composers don't have the pressure to attract immediately for applause an atmosphere in which one need not expect standardized reactions. Where you could be Kafka. Kafka didn't write for the applause. Well, where is Kafka today? But abolishing applauses would be helpful, just as the women's quota uh, enforces other conditions from above. The abolition of applause would help in concrete terms, but also symbolically, also as a representative or a metaphor for art criticism in general. It is not enough to abolish applause. The whole thing stands for a different perceptual atmosphere of art. It must become clear again that art cannot be about appeal. It is clear that it is not a matter of direct sympathy when there is mass destruction of instruments, orally introduced guitar strings that cause vomiting of the performer, video recordings of 9-11 with sheet music put on top of it for long minutes, obvious exploitation and expropriation, an orchestral commission fulfilled only with erased notes, suspended quality and working standards, or even if you keep the audience from applauding. Sex, violence, impertinence, disgust and embarrassment. One can argue that these are cheap means to force effect and nobody wants to let that happen on him or herself or even reward the order for letting them have unavoidable effects. So in return, the defiant, boring, is called out immediately. However, it is not acceptable that these means cannot be used Especially such universal themes and feelings. We have to do it. I'm rather disgusted by pieces that obviously go for applause. 
It is clear that this is not exactly a partnership, but confrontational or even brutal, that in such moments the audience stands weak, is embarrassed or even ashamed, that it goes to the sensitivities, to the questioning of moral structures, to personal instincts, to what is preserved, that one has to behave to it, but does not want to admit vulnerability, that one is better cool and finds defensive strategies than to open oneself. After all, that's something. If it gets that far, and to a certain extent, it might take on a different character. Then the time would be to drop the defensive attitude. If there is a reflex, reflection can also begin. At a higher level, this transcended to quality. Where there is psychological insight and self-analysis, where there are real scruples, agreement is also or only possible. Both together result in the presence of an open mind. It is not easy to credit to the artist that he or she pushes on your comfort zone, just as it, is, as it is difficult to pay respect to someone for making themselves vulnerable. And it would take courage to acknowledge someone's courage to take artistic risk when failure is so easy to laugh at. What attacks makes itself attackable. But the audience and critics may brace themselves, I was excitable. I am an individual artist, but if I may give some suggestions. Artists, avoid competition as best as you can. Be a monopoly of yourself. Make pieces that are good and bad at the same time. Too short and too long, too loud and too quiet, right and wrong. Obscure the standards. Show that criteria first have to be developed for you, instead of letting yourself being compared with others. Show that quick judgments is not possible. Hide your claims. This is, of course, a claim in itself, so also hide this intention. Critiques. Don't try desperately to get back to a position where your thumbs could point up or down. Don't start to ask, well, has the piece ever come so far as to demand its own categories, and so on. This is always your job to provide categories, to interpret, not to give an opinion. Call yourself interpreters. Mediate. Be partners. Institutions support individuality. All of you abolish applause as a sign against evaluation and that the piece is open. Or artists, don't give a shit. Thank you.